that's just how we do. These just friends, man. That's my guy. <laughs> I was just showing him some love. She jumped me, man. That bitch sucker punched me from behind. Put the ass on me coming and didn't do shit about it, bitch ass motherfucker. As we enter the world of raising Kanan, we started to learn the origin story of not just Kanan Stark, but also Jukebox. And where season 1 set the foundation of where both of these characters are, season 2 definitely focused on events which no doubt gave us a glimpse into the characters we became accustomed to on power. So season 2 of Raising Kanan further dived deeper into the trauma Duke suffered as a kid. We saw her having to cope with Nicole's death, reconnecting with Kenya which resulted in this vile treatment because of who she was, but stood by her sexuality and identity which also indirectly brought her closer to her father. Something which ironically created this broken relationship in the first place. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to do good now. For you. For everyone. But season 2 did a great job in further separating Levan from Jukebox. Because where we saw these different layers, Kanan's narration did tell us this was one of the reasons why Jukebox became the cold hearted character we were introduced to in DC used to get the same question over and over from every motherfucker that met Juke down the line. How she get so cold-blooded? But shit like this, it's gonna hurt for as long as you live it. But this pain and trauma that Juke suffered in season 2 is just the tip of the iceberg because there is definitely a lot more to come. But we have to be patient because these characters won't change overnight. Now this is what the showrunner Sasha Penn had to say on Jukebox post season 2. I think that shift started to happen a little bit, where you're telling the origin story. Obviously, you're trying to explain how these characters become later. Jukebox and Kanan could not be more ruthless. So we're definitely starting to get a sense of that. Even that sort of conversion scene for Jukebox in season 2, which was pretty brutal. We are starting to get a sense of the building blocks of who they become. One thing I see all the time on social media is, how did Kanan and Jukebox fall apart to the point that Kanan kills her the way he did in power? And what I would say is, there is a lot of story to tell between them. And that question will be answered. It's not going to be answered tomorrow, but it will be answered. We will definitely explain how the two of them could go from how they've been to, to how they've become. Hey Ma. I love you. Love you too, Joe. Fucking bitch, run in your mouth. This relationship between Duke and Kanan definitely continues to grow closer, especially with how both of them are facing their own issues in terms of their relationship with their parents. And we've seen them confide in each other throughout both season 1 and 2. But along the way, some cracks will definitely begin to appear, and it may not be in season 3, but I think we've already seen some sort of foreshadow. I know your secrets, Duke. I suggest you watch your fucking mouth. Although kids are always fighting, it has been said by Corny Kemp, Kanan got this scar from Jukebox in a fight when they were younger and that's something I wonder if the writers will consider which would definitely contribute towards some tension between them. But there's definitely going to be some game changing moments in their relationship beyond just a scrap. A theory I would love to see come to life in Raising Kanan is how Duke held Tariq hostage in power. Imagine if Duke did something similar when they were younger. For example, holding a loved one of Kanan hostage in the same way she did Tariq with a gun to their head but pulling the trigger because it really would go a long way in explaining the fear in Ghost's eyes when he heard Jukebox was the one holding Tariq and also why Tommy Egan called her a crazy bitch. Both of them not only knew who Jukebox was but what she was capable of and so with that being said, at some point, Tommy and Ghost would have crossed paths with Jukebox to know how she was crazy but I don't expect that to happen until maybe season 5. But it is something which I think is integral, not just to introduce them for Kanan's story, but also Jukebox. Now, one of the saddest scenes when it comes to Duke's character is how we saw her sitting on this bench waiting for Nicole when she was never going to appear because she died smoking the bad batch of crack Kanan corked. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something similar at the beginning of season 3. Marvin told Jukebox they'll go to Lamont's diner after he was done with his run. But as we all know, Marvin's in no condition to eat food for a change. But I wouldn't be surprised if Jukebox has the same feelings coming back to her when she was on the bench waiting for Nicole with a mixture of sadness and fear. 
because she's just about rebuilding this relationship with Marvin, who also knows the game could end up in death at any given moment. So although she may feel a little let down by Marvin not showing up at Lamont's diner, she'll be relieved to know he's not dead. And so season 3 will be exploring an element of happiness for Duke, and Marvin will definitely be a part of this happiness, but it still is a relationship which is very much a work in progress. And ironically, it's actually thanks to Kenya for bringing Marvin and Jukebox closer. Now, there is a lot to consider when we look at the relationship between Duke and Kenya. For example, why did Duke look for Kenya? How Rock warned Duke, blood doesn't make you family. And how Kenya found out Duke was gay, which was definitely the catalyst in this breakdown between the relationship between mother and daughter. But it all started with Nicole's death. Duke living in this fucked up world where she knows the consequences are a part of the game. And being alone in this world, finding a picture of her mom when she was just a kid, I'm sure made her curious as to find out why her mom left. But again, it was something Rock already told Duke. But can we really blame Duke for not believing Rock and wanting to find out the answers for herself? Definitely not. Now, from the way Duke was dressed and how Twin Low stepped to Duke in episode 6, definitely made Kenya aware of Duke's sexuality. And so it's no coincidence the past year was giving lessons about Leviticus 18 and according to a verse, highlights how same-sex relations is considered a sin. But Corey was also a plan set by Kenya as well. That's bitch for you right here, come on! Jukebox ran these streets harder than men, according to Kanan Stark in power, and he wasn't lying. This was just a glimpse of what Duke is capable of and the writers are only scratching the surface of Duke's ruthlessness, and I wouldn't be surprised to see her go one step further in season 3. But speaking of kills, one death we did see in the finale was Kenya, and I wonder how Duke would react to Kenya's death, because the last time they saw each other, Duke told her she was fine without her, and how she didn't need her. But Kenya being in the wrong place at the wrong time, she was caught in the crossfire in this war with the Italians. But Kenya was actually here to tell Rock what Duke did to Corey, but what about what she did to Jukebox? I would have loved to have seen what Rock would have said about that. But now it definitely is all eyes on how Duke reacts to Kenya's death in Season 3. Now, one person who I do think is worth mentioning is Linda Bingham. She continued to be a problem at the beginning of Season 2. And with her being well connected to the mayor, I can see her causing a problem again in Season 3. Especially after Duke admitted to James that Nicole got the drugs from her bag and not Detective Berg. So this side plot involving James, Linda and Jukebox is definitely one to watch as we move into Season 3. But as we talk about Detective Berg, she just seems to be someone who's continuously in and out of Jukebox's life. But regardless of Berg helping Duke get out of this holding cell, Duke will never snitch and it is something the actor Hayley Kilgore echoed on social media. And so I don't think any of us have anything to worry about Duke telling Berg something she shouldn't. But with Berg hanging around until Season 3, I wouldn't be surprised if she played a part in Jude becoming a cop, but that also seems a bit too obvious, and so I do wonder what also plays a part in future seasons, especially because we all know how Duke is a great singer, which is also something she referenced to Tariq in a conversation they had in power. And so where does her singing career go now that Rock has control of Bulletproof Records, and her relationship with Lou isn't in the best of places after the move he pulled with Ziza? But that's a breakdown of where we are, not just with Jukebox, but how our origin story is equally as important as Kanan's, not just to paint the picture of who she became, but where we need to learn the potential fallout in their relationship, why Ghost feared what Duke was capable of, the impact of Kenya's death, as well as her ongoing relationship with Marvin. But drop all your thoughts down below on all things Jukebox and how they've left a character going into Raising Kanan Season 3. And of course, if you are new to the channel and you haven't done so already, now remember to smash the subscribe button if you want to see everything Power Book 3 and Power Universe related. But as always, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.